here. While I normally host all the episodes for the BPD Bunch today, I'm handing the reins over to Selene because our topic is one that she is incredibly passionate about, BPD and family culture. She spends a lot of time thinking about how cultural differences affect the expression of borderline personality disorder in individuals. And I can't think of a single episode that she was in where the topic didn't come up at least once. Selene also hosts her own live talk show called The Inclusion Conversation. It aims to break down borders and bring the world closer together one conversation at a time. Check out the description for links and information on her next episode. Selene, are you ready for this? Yes, so excited. Thanks for having me. Well, I look forward to all of the stories and helpful tips on this topic. So take it away, Selene. You got this. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the BPD Bunch Show. I'm your host today, Selene, and I'm here with Sophie, Raf, Madarima, and Andre. So where in the world is everyone joining from? I'm from Kolkata in India. I'm from Southampton in the UK. I'm Melbourne. It's nice. It's cold. It's early in the morning, but we're here and we're excited. London in the UK. Yes, me too. Joining from London in the UK as well. So today we're going to be talking about family culture and BPD. Uh, The way that we define culture is it's a particular set of morals, codes, traditions that are shared by a social group of related people. And we're going to be looking at it as a bit of a funnel. So starting from the country, society, culture, then looking at community, family, and finally the lived experience and how we've brought everything to the individual, from the collective to the individual level. Can you describe or tell us a little bit each about the culture that you grew up in? So like my culture was asylum seekers from El Salvador, moved to Australia, fled the war, all that sort of stuff. You know, we had to leave, we had to like leave our family, which is like, you know, quite like traumatic for the parents and everything like that. We had like the like emotional deprivation of the machismo in Latino culture and like needing to buckle down and work as hard as possible because we moved to a new culture while needing to integrate. And also, I guess in Australian culture, there wasn't a lot of like dealing with your feelings either. So it was very much just like work hard and be appreciative kind of culture, which sounds nice in theory, but yeah, can be a bit difficult. I definitely relate to it. Yeah. Yeah. I also come from like a very traditional Indian family and all of them have been in the same place for like at least three generations now. There's definitely a lot of people pleasing involved. There's definitely a lack of boundaries. There's people who probably don't mean much to you, but since you're related by blood, their opinions will make an important mark in your life, for example, even if you don't want it to. I I will have people who have not seen for five years and they'll be like, oh, remember, I'm your uncle from this place and I think you should be doing this with your life. Who the hell are you? And (laughs) I'm like, yeah, basically. I was looking at my um, my maladaptive schemas, like after doing schema therapy, and they're all, I've got a list here, they're all basically related to like the cultural pressures, like self-sacrifice, emotional deprivation, unrelenting standards, (laughs) all those cultural bindings just kind of, came into one and just created all my scheme all my maladaptive schemes it's brutal yeah and like definitely the like pressure of just you know like you have to Mm. be something in your life like very science focused like it's engineer or doctor those are the primes Mm. of our society and you have to be one of them i kind of sometimes hate telling my achievements to like some of my distant relatives because i am a doctor now and Some people think that I've become a doctor to please these people, but I actually (laughs) love being a doctor and I love my job and it's because I love it I'm here. I come from what I would call a traditional yet progressive Caribbean family. Um, And like some of the others, um, even though there are certain expected norms from my family culture, um, from my um, greater culture, my family always encouraged me to be myself, be different. Um, For instance, there weren't any clearly defined gender roles in my family because it was a matriarchal family. So we were expected to do things as men like cooking and cleaning, which from that older generation would say that's man or or woman's or them work. 
So it was very much a case of family first as well. So the family before everything, um, with good, strong moral codes, a highly religious family. Even though it was an open-minded family, the culture was quite restrictive. So I've literally had to step away from the norms and values of my original family dynamic and create my own because I, I have to accept that certain members of my own family won't understand some of the things that I practice in, in this modern way. My family's Gambian, as I said, but my mum and dad met in Finland, so I was born in Finland. Um, my mum was there from when she was about 15, so that had a big influence. Fast forward, you know, we moved here and, um, like, I don't feel like we kind of followed the Gambian culture very much. So I find myself having to kind of soul search or do my own thing, uh, like culture searching. I, when we came here, I went over to Gambia for two years. So I learned the language. So I'm fluent, which is amazing. Cause I just yes. feel like that's the one yes. part that like, go girl. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, your language, you know, um, <laughs> my, my dad and my mom, well, more my dad was very much sort of like, you know, doctor, nurse, no, doctor, mm. pharmacist, lawyer, like as if those were the only trades that you can mm. get into. Like if you're not doing that, then why, why are you even here sort of thing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that was pretty hard. Um, I think relative to like pride, like showing up as like somebody that they could be like, yeah, my sons are this, my daughter's a, you know, top lawyer at her firm or whatever like that that's like what pride is based on so I think um that was very much a big big value growing up um just no, knowing that you ha you have to work hard you know <laughs> um mm. and I think that also like perpetuated that feeling of like what will people say which is uh, like I definitely feel like I adopted you know like even now as a grown-up I'm kind of like oh what will people say and I have to like say to myself no no that's not what we're doing today we're going to take our own, you know, pathway, honey. Like, don't be mm -hmm. listening to other people. Um, how did you go next? So, um, grew up in France, um, French parents, born, raised in the same country, generations and generations of, of French people as well. I think the culture in general, very, like, pushing for success. Both my parents are engineers. Um, mainly people are either engineers or doctors, basically, all in science. So there I appeared. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I love art. Can I grow? Can I dance? Right, Can I do right. Stuff? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the culture, very rational. Like, you know, mm. everything has a place and everything makes sense. And, you know, why are you so emotional? You know, I, and I was there, you know, this ball of emotion, like, oh, you know. <laughs> It's like, no, you know, like, just, just get over it. It's no big deal. It's a massive deal. So, so definitely felt like an odd one out um, in the kind of small family unit, but also in the wider family as well. Um, and really struggled with finding kind of a middle ground, a middle path between the expectations and my own nature and and you know what I wanted to do who I wanted to be and and all of these things and when I was 18 I left uh, France for the first time I moved to Norway then I lived in the US then in the UK then China then Australia uh, and now I'm back in the UK in London so almost half my life I've spent in different countries now um, mm -hmm. and it was really in Australia first with uh, and maybe Raf you can relate to this uh, are you okay day that I realized oh, I'm not okay can we talk about that do people <laughs> talk about these things oh my god really really um, and, are you okay uh, day yeah because in France like especially at work yeah uh -uh. your work life is your work life your personal life is your personal life my parents taught me and brought me up in a culture where those two things are completely separate Really? Um, so there's a clear divide and you, you don't bring your whole self to work. You don't trust anyone at work. They're not your friends. They're your colleagues. And there's a big difference, etc. So, That's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cause like in Australia, like your work, the people who you work with kind of eventually become like your close friends. Like Danny, my best friend who I dated her for eight years, we met at work and all of our entire circle of friends were from work or like in music or something like that. So that blows my mind that that's just not a thing. It's changing. But yeah, generations prior, it's, it's 
big big divide and definitely no emotions at work no so and if you even go to france now and i joke about about this with my sister all the time a lot of american and british companies go you know and say let's have a session about emotions mental health well-being and french people go like <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure, like, whatever. I mean, that's clearly like an Anglo-Saxon kind of, <laughs> kind of issue. Like, we don't, you know, we, we're fine. We're good. We're good. And then shrug it away and move on, you know? <laughs> As part of my culture, I don't know if this is a prejudice or racist thing, but it, it also got um, imprinted on me that um, only sort of mostly white people go to therapy and and these things it's acceptable so it was almost like yes it's acceptable for these discuss therapy but for us it's not because if you do discuss it you're bringing the shame of shame upon the family and most importantly yeah. stop being mm. stop being so soft get on yeah. with it man. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. are you complaining about in like latino culture like yeah we got the machismo it's just like now you just deal with it like, you, you, there's more important stuff to deal with than your emotions other people yeah. have dealt with it. African culture as well. Yeah. You depressed? Like, open a window. L- yeah. Wash your face. Go outside. What do you, you mean? Sad, you have some depressed. food. You're like, no, right, we, need to, exactly. we need to talk. No, you need to eat. I'm like, no. <laughs> awesome. So let's move on to the juicy bits. Um, <laughs> we're starting with the question, like, how does or did your family culture, so it could be your close family or wider family, view BPD? Um, the good, the bad, anything in between. Andre, go for it. Imagine the scene. It was the year AD before BPD became really hardcore. Mental health and trauma were not were not discussed in my family as, as a standard thing. Um, so the actual understanding of BPD itself, I, I think that still eludes a lot of my family members, which is why I'm actually doing this show in the hope that they can watch it and be a bit more informed. Um, I came from a family that were quite religious. So when you first say anything like you don't feel well, the natural thing is you need to go and pray this out of you because that's that's the go-to way to solve problems. Then if that didn't work, it would be think about other family members who might be um, in a more vulnerable position. They might need your help. And they should be your priority because you, you're not able to break down now because they need you. So the sheer um, amount of guilt and shame that, that manifests in you, the thought of me not being able to fix what's in my head, I hid it. I hid it away from my whole family. I would literally lie um, to them about reasons why I was in a bad situation, anything opposed to admitting that I was there. And when you do initially talk to some people in my family, they wanted to try their best. But what they also wanted to do was you was fix you by doing what makes them feel better. So it's almost a place where you're listening, but you're not understanding. And then the other end is almost like um, I think there's been a clear lack of education because people are often confuse with the difference in um, between mental health and mental illness. So most of my um, family members that I've spoken to have just assumed that I'm having a bad few weeks and they almost have this thing of, well, asking me to do something that, what would they do in that situation? So when you come from a high achieving family, their, their answer would normally to throw yourself into work or to busy yourself and then you kind of be able to move on and forget about it and recover. Yeah, the throwing yourself into work thing. Um, I lost count of the amount of times where, like, I would be like upset or like shit or shaken or just something, but not know about it because I'd be like, oh, I've got too much work to do. I'm just going to focus on that for a while. I remember one time I was in Sydney, just cooking dinner, had big beautiful house, cooking a beautiful dinner. Everything was great. Oh, this is so much fun! And boom, I just started bawling my eyes out. And I was just like, everything is good, but why am I so sad? So like, I think I mentioned before, like, you know, because we have those, like, we have to work, we don't do, don't worry about our feelings, we don't do all that. Um, my PPD, well, my maladaptive schemas, which are like thought of as filters through which we form our behavioral strategies and our perceptions of ourselves and others. 
So basically, like, you know, the way we act and the way we view ourselves through those ways we act and how we behave to other people. My most maladaptive schemas are, like, self-sacrifice and emotional deprivation and unrelenting standards. So, like, if something needs to get done, I will do everything I can to help that situation, but just to an extreme where I stop taking care of myself and stop even really taking care of anything around me because this thing, I need to sacrifice, I need to sacrifice myself for that, um, either physically or emotionally. It's just this weird sort of like, yeah, you bury yourself underneath as much work and as much prestige, as much stuff that you can do, but eventually it's going to come like, come and hit you when you don't expect it. So my thing is just like, deal with it. And my family is kind of only really now getting their head around like mental health issues in general. Even kind of having a view on BPD, I don't think they have one. It's not from a lack of them wanting to. Mm. I just think they don't know how. Sophia, Madrima, any uh, reflections on how did or does your family culture view BPD? I kind of agree with what Raf said because um, I don't think they have yet formed a view on what BPD is because I don't think they understand what it is. When I try to explain them that, um, to put it very, very simply, it's emotional dysregulation it doesn't make sense to them because like they believe that uh, the emotional state of mind is something that should be buried like deep deep without down and if you're feeling things if you're like too emotional for example like if there's a crisis situation and you get like very scared and you end up crying which is a very normal reaction for a kid to do i would face I, I don't know, like criticism, like you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to stay calm and level headed. And like, if you let your emotions guide you through things like this, you'll never make it out. So it was kind of uh, whenever I felt things or whenever things got too heavy, I would suppress it down because showing too much emotion was weak and uh, you didn't survive the real world that way. For people who have also dealt with it, with the same way, I don't think they're ready to understand yet to accept that there is nothing wrong with feeling things. It's a healthier way to cope with emotions, but they're come warming up to it. So I would say right now, the view on BPD, it's like, it's work in progress. One baby step at a time. <laughs> Sophie, what about you? My close family members are only really starting to get it like the older generation anyway, like the younger ones have like, some of them have taken themselves into therapy, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is really nice. Um, but a few years back when someone was characterized as like aggressive or like just the person who would lose their shit all the time or whatever, it was just like, oh yeah, that's so-and-so, that's just the crazy mm. person. They get annoyed, they get angry, that's just them. But it was never like, there's like a, deeper level to why this is happening it's just they're just they're just mad definitely like there's this element of like toxic positivity you yeah. know like when people are kind of like when you're like i'm having a crap day and you know you're feeling maybe a bit like depressed or suicidal or something there's people out there who have it worse than you or like things happen for a reason and i'm like okay it will stop right there for a second yeah. can we just be where i am at right now and just like validate my emotions like mm. let me just have my moment to land um but i definitely feel like it's moving in the right direction um because also like me going through treatment has really shown them like how much i've progressed as a person but like the funny thing is if I ask somebody like oh, in the older generation, oh, so would you consider therapy? Like, you know, I've been and it's changed my life. And they're like, therapy? What am I going to do that for? <laughs> Can you not see same, it? Like same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same. Well, I'm fine. Why do I need to do that? Right, I'm fine. Yeah. Like, I'll just have some coffee and, and go to work, it. you know? <laughs> and they'll say it they're like uh, uh, you we see how far you've come and it's amazing mm. and all this growth and you're like yeah so you can do the same thing it's like no no that no. one no it's like yeah. yeah so much of this resonates to be honest um i wanted to share with you a little bit of a story 
for my family, uh, mental health was um, something that you had to hide, hide behind closed doors. So my auntie on my dad's side, so his sister, um, was diagnosed with bipolar when she was about 13. And from then on, um, my grandma, my granddad, they didn't have any friends. They didn't let anyone come into the house. She was not going out of the house. My grandma just stayed at home with her. And my dad never really said nice things about her. And I love my dad to bits, so please don't take it any other way. Um, is you know, it's complicated and it's a different generation. But that meant that in my mind as a child, you know, seeing her and seeing how, you know, what was happening, I thought, oh my God, I can never have anything anywhere close to, you know, what she has. Because if I do, then everyone will reject me. I will be, you know, locked inside and never be allowed to go out, etc. And I felt different from a really young age. And I knew that I had more in common with her than I let on. But for me, it was so important to mask because of that fear of being rejected and excluded from the family. Um, fast forward, when I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder in the UK, I had heard of it once as a teenager because a friend of mine was diagnosed with the same diagnosis. But... In French, I haven't come across yet any equivalent for the word borderline. So we do translate personality disorder into trouble de la personnalité. But when it comes to borderline, we just say trouble de la personnalité borderline. And that gives you an idea of how known it is. If there is no word, there is no conversation or very limited conversation and very, very limited understanding. And I found that really hard because it's like you're being diagnosed in a different language, you're experiencing something in a different language, and yet what you're experiencing, so much of it is attached to how you were brought up and your culture and so many of the things we're talking about. I know Bengali and Hindi, and I don't know an equivalent of borderline in either one of those. So on that note, I was just going to share that I needed to explain this to everyone around me because nobody had any idea of what this thing was. And before being a part of this bunch, I knew one person from the internet who had BPD and there is nobody else in my whole circle. I don't know, it kind of feels like um, this. there's this diagnosis which is identifying me as, okay, I have BPD. And after being a part of this show, I don't feel like it's a bad thing. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. Yes. I, I need to learn this. I need to learn how to put down. I'm, I'm, like, like, I'm like a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I, I really want us to get into recovery side of things. Um, a lot of you have um, talked about, you know, finding kind of a balance or a way to cope with you you choosing to grow to change to engage in in recovery versus the family culture in many times kind of staying where it's at and not necessarily a, being approved uh, approving of that so how have you been able to navigate that kind of dual situation and what's been helpful the one thing for me that i didn't realize helped was actually moving to another country and, and then moving to a larger city because, as I said, I came from a very small island with a very much of a small town um, village mentality. And in, in, that, in that place, everybody has the same sim or very similar shared experiences. So by mixing with people from diverse cultures outside of my own, that's been a major factor in my path to recovery because it allowed me to see that there are other ways to heal and to do things and th this is not the only one singular way to fix a problem so what i realized is for much of the pre-treatment years i was lying to myself about my willingness and my availability and and to, to want to be healed so actually engaging with um, a gp a general practitioner doctor first of all um, and unfortunately through um, me not wanting to be on the planet, I engaged with what we call a crisis team, which ordinarily would have been seen as a negative thing, 
but it's the best thing that happened to me because it forced me again to address my issues. But the singular most important thing I can say to anyone watching is take the first step by talking to someone that you feel can give you a safe space. It doesn't have to be a medical professional initially, but make sure it's someone who will then maybe try to support you to reach out and ask for help. One of my friends actually phoned my doctor on my behalf because I was so embarrassed to phone. So they literally made me go to a doctor and video called the doctor and said, right, this is the problem. Thank you, Jacqueline, for that. I love you so much for making me do that. I can definitely relate to the first point that you mentioned about moving to a different place. Um, I think in two ways. One, I left home when I was 17 and I realized how you know much positive there was at home that I didn't see because I was in the BPD mind as well, right? Because everything was black and white extreme thinking and it was usually really dark at that moment. And so stepping away, having to live on my own and realize, oh, when I move, I also take myself with me. Hmm, maybe there's something there. <laughs> So I think that was really instrumental. And then same as what you said, Andre, like living in cultures that where you can talk about mental health, where you can go to therapy and not be judged for it, where, you, you know, it's actually encouraged. You know what I mean? Like, that's like, whoa, like that was absolutely game changing. Um, the second thing for me was I wrote a, a memoir um, when I actually arrived in Australia um, about kind of, yeah, my well, I guess my life <laughs> from birth or what I remember of it uh, to about 30 and my family read it. And it was the first time that I think they read my version of our story mm. and it could have gone really badly, don't get me wrong, uh, but I was really lucky. Like it, a few things shocked them, but a lot of it, they were like, wow, like that's how you felt you know and, and it just mm. started those conversations and it shifted also our relationship towards you know with my parents like and even with my sister more like adult to adult relationships rather mm. than you know uh kind of authority kind of relationships so so yeah that was really instrumental um and then the final thing that i found super helpful uh, when, you know, all of the kind of culture and expectations and all the things that we've talk, touched on kind of trigger me and trigger my symptoms is self-soothe. Um, so it's usually going to involve a teddy bear. <laughs> um, a few a few of us I know in the bunch have uh, their go-to the cuddly toys or soft fabrics. So squishmallows! <laughs> <love> squishmallows. <laughs> I have one in each room. Um, and definitely that kind of, yeah, self-soothing through soft objects. It just really helps me to kind of bring me back into my body, back into the moment when I feel triggered by those different family expectations or stories or limiting beliefs. So like the the growth within myself part, definitely like seeing a therapist and having a specialist and a psychiatrist. That all was a thing to help me figure out what it was that I guess I felt misunderstood about by my family. So like, I always knew that there was something different about me. I like literally since I was in my earliest memory in like prep was me thinking like, I'm just different than everybody else here. And I don't know why going through that process of like figuring out what it was that I didn't know about myself. So I could then communicate that to my family or to other people. Cause before that it was just like, I'm angry or I'm sad or you guys piss me off. Like the first conversation I had with my mum about anything like anxiety or depression related was me just yelling at her on the phone, telling her to just leave me alone. Which didn't really help. It let her know that I was going through shit, but it didn't really start a conversation or anything. After freaking all that out, I've been able to yeah, kind of communicate that, I guess in a way that I know that they could understand. You can communicate the exact same thing in two different ways and have two very, very different results. Um, and I think it was mostly that figuring out my own thing. And then also things like this, like finding that community where you can hear other people's stories of the same thing and increase and like enhance your own vocabulary of what it is that you're going through. And then communicating that to the family around you. That's probably been the most helpful thing. Um, going through therapy and all that sort of stuff. 
that's probably been like one of the bigger things for me. Um, which is hard because a lot of those treatment options are expensive and like not covered, but yeah, that's a, it's definitely been my biggest thing personally anyways. Moving abroad is also an expensive option, <laughs> uh, which, <laughs> which is true. It's like treatments are moving abroad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's fair that, um, yeah, some of the op these options are, are not, you know, readily available. I think other things that you can do in terms of like just changing your environment, you know, it could be like uh, meeting new friends, uh, going to unexpected events, you know, following different people online. There's lots of ways to kind of move without moving, if that makes sense. So I think, yeah, I think that was a big thing when uh, Danny and I moved to Sydney, like completely away. When we just moved to the city away from my family a little bit and then moved to Sydney completely far away, that's when we started actually, yeah, kind of thinking about like mental health issues. And yeah, it was actually yeah. probably one of the biggest steps personally before all the therapy. So yeah, I'll probably agree with that, the moving. As somebody who has not had the like, I don't know, means or luxury to move, I think what is really important is to have patience and to have that intent in the form of that mm. very positive voice in your head. Like uh, for me, it was like, I was determined that I can't feel like this about myself anymore. So I have to mm. do something about it. And I was still in the same household that I grew up and I still am. But what is important is that you have your own space. Like even if it's not a physical space, your own mental mm. space, like you have your own journals or your own creative space or your own workspace. Or even if you don't have that in your house, you can, you know, go outside, sit in a little sit in the grass or in a little cafe and like do some thinking and some reflections and that's what I did so and that worked for me and that it was really important for me to have that self-confidence back and to have that self-worth in me reinstated so I ha could have that conversation with my parents where I could talk about see these are the problems that I'm having and I need you to meet me halfway and this is how we can move on from these problems. And uh, Sophie, what what do you think? I kind of went down the rabbit hole of like, you know, uh, studying psychology and stuff like that. And I was in and out of therapy from a young age because my mum always used to say, stop telling people your business. But I was just so open minded and wanted to like speak to people and understand things. And I feel like that led me to where I am and who I am today. I was curious enough to go and find out about myself, you know? I know that when I'm able to not react, but rather respond and like ask the questions and remain curious, then I always, I, you can't go wrong, can you? Sometimes I do. Um, but yeah, that's definitely been a thing. And being compassionate towards like other people, especially having become a mother myself, Sometimes I want to do the same BS that like happened to me, you know, when I'm upset or I'm in a mood or like she does something and I want to criticize her and I'm like, Ugh! hold on. It's made me think, OK, so my parents might have felt even more than this and not able, like, and they weren't able to like process it and be like have a filter because they didn't go through the journey that I went through, which was me being curious and finding out and learning more about myself. So, yeah, I think definitely having a child, being curious and, you know, cultivating compassion has definitely helped you in my journey. Yeah, I think this has been really, really good uh, to hear just everyone's, um, you know, takeaways on balancing the, our, our own growth and then the, the navigating our family cultures uh, without being you know in a, in a blame state or um you know just putting everything on one side or the other right we also need to take some ownership <laughs> lots of ownership for um how we show up in the world and we've mentioned this earlier but also it's about how does it change from here what is going to be our input you know is it going to be going from react to respond is it going to be going for treatment to understand ourselves better and show up differently in the world is it going to be becoming different parents whatever it is what are we going to do to, to take ownership and to um you know take in in a positive direction i just i don't know if i like actually made it out like my family is supportive like my close 
you know, knit family are very much supportive, including my mum. She tries harder than anybody. And my sister watches the episodes every time they're out. She was like, you killed it, girl. Like, <laughs> I, I don't want to seem like I'm trash talking my family because it's not that at all. <laughs> uh, outside some of the, the less happy moments, I still come from a family that have taught me how to overcome problems. And it, it's that core... Um, mentality that has put me where I am today. They, they they still instilled in me the ability to believe that I could be better and I I, I can thrive in any environment. So for that, to my family, I'm very grateful. That I kind of want to send a shout out to my family. Like, is that okay? Let's go. I have a very 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 uh, sweet family, and I'm really really glad for all the hope and the support they show. And I love my parents, and I love my sister, and I wouldn't be where I am without them right now. So yay! I think thank you to my mum mostly for like allowing me to kind of just be open and like expressing how I was feeling and stuff like that when it would have been really hard for her to make space for even her to express how she was feeling. Love your family, chosen or. Biological. Thank you. Shout out my mum, my sisters, uh, and my friends. You guys are amazing. You know who you are. You are amazing at trying to understand and digest and just be there for me and hold space for me. So I love you guys. Big up yourselves. A huge thank you to my parents and my sister for accepting me in the way that I am and thank you to my husband for loving me somehow <laughs> even when I don't know how to love myself uh, and thank you to this community and all of my friends who have been around uh, through thick and thin so thank you for bearing with me for, for it all <laughs> I'm gonna cry <laughs> stop it are we accepting the Oscars or something? <laughs> This is better too. And thank better you too is good. to uh, my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, we haven't heard your uh, parting words. I just want to shout out to my uncle James for being so supportive. Um, when everyone else kind of uh, gave up, he, he tried his best to tell me to keep going. And to my sister, for uh, actually my baby sister, who's actually my little role model. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, family. Boom. We love Uncle James. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. We hope that you got some value from this episode and learned something useful to take into your own recovery. If you like this episode, make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so that you don't miss a thing. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon, please, so we can keep <laughs> making the show because we love it. Details are in the link in the description. Um, next week, we're going to be back for some lovey-dovey stories. Um, we're going to have four members of the cast and their long-term partners coming on the show and telling us about what it's like to mix BPD and relationships. So watch this space. See you then. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.